welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. You can watch this lesson real time on Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We're also live on Music 99 and GoJamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subject, you can send them into Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica. Today's lesson is on Cape Economics Unit 1, where we will be focusing on the demand for and supply of factors. I am Shanique Francis. Now, our objectives for today include to apply the marginal productivity theory to the demand for capital. We will also explain the supply of capital and the concepts of economic rent and transfer earnings. Now, if you watched last week, you would have noticed that we started this topic. It's topic one for module three. And last week, we focused on the, the demand for land and also labor. Today, we're focusing on the demand for capital. Now, what you will need for today's lesson quickly, please grab your pen or pencil, a paper and your calculator. I want you to participate in this lesson and to just do some of the, the checks with me to ensure that whatever I'm showing you, you can also see that result for yourself when you do your calculations. So just a quick recap. Now the theory of distribution explains how factor markets clear. The theory examines the fact that all products are all factors of productions are owned by households and the households sell these factors to firms and in return firms will produce goods and services and sell them to households so as i mentioned before last week we focused on land and labor and today we're looking at capital now i want you to bear this question in mind and i want you to remember it as we continue today's lesson you just started high school and your parents promised to give you $10,000 when you are graduating in five years. But my question to you is, is, is $10,000 in five years as valuable as $10,000 today? So if you get $10,000 today and you keep it for five years, will you be able to maybe purchase the same amount of things with that $10,000? So bear that in mind as we go forward. Now, if financial institutions are offering a 6% interest rate, how much money would you need today in order for it to be equal to $10,000 in five years time? So, if your parents promise you $10,000 in five years time, right? And you also know that maybe it's a possibility you can get this money today. So you want to know, how do you get to $10,000 in five years time if they give you a sum of money today? What would that sum need to be? So we're looking at the demand for capital and in examining the demand for capital, it looks at buildings and equipment. So in this sense, when we're talking about factors of production and we mention capital, we are really talking about buildings and equipment or machinery. Do not confuse capital at this stage with financial capital. Now also consider that the demand for capital includes the roundabout methods of production, which simply means that in production, capital goods are produced in order for them to be used to produce consumer goods. So the capital goods are the durable goods that are created in order for you to create the goods that the consumers would want. We will also look at the fact that capital accumulation requires savings. So in order for you to purchase a machinery, and if it is that you're gonna purchase a machinery as a business owner, you may need to get a loan. In order for you to get a loan from a financial institution, financial institutions do have to have cash and they have to get that cash from their customers or clients who are savings. So in order for the, this process to take place, acquiring capital, somebody has to save so that you can spend. In addition, the demand for capital is linked to the MRP. And if you joined us last week or if you were paying attention in your classes this year, you'd remember that the MRP is the marginal revenue product. So it is linked with the marginal revenue product of capital over the course of its productive life. 
capital lasts for a long period. So please remember. All right, so when is more capital demanded by a firm? Right? How do firms make that decision? So last week we, we spoke about how firms make the decisions as it relates to, you know, do we hire more people? And they make a comparison between the cost of acquiring additional labor and the marginal revenue product that that additional unit of labor would bring to the business. So they have to consider in the same way when we're looking at capital, the marginal revenue generated by capital and the marginal cost over the productive life of the capital unit. In addition, capital is used if the present value of the additional benefit is higher than the present value of the additional cost. And you'll hear this term some more as we continue. Now, when a firm is considering to purchase additional capital, this is considered as an investment decision. And it is an investment because we know that when they invest in capital or when capital is purchased, they're not just purchasing the capital to, you know, decorate the business or the, the manufacturing plant or whatever facility they have. They are purchasing capital so that it can be used to create further wealth or to create more goods. So this is why it's called an investment decision. So the demand for capital is also referred to as investment demand. So a firm that is seeking to maximize profit, they will make this same decision or they will make this decision based on the same principle as the demand for labor as mentioned before. Now, a firm must compare the marginal revenue product of the investment which is the money that the firm will earn from the investment. So the firm is going to look at, okay, if I want to purchase an additional machine, right, for my manufacturing plant, they're going to have to make a comparison to determine how, how much money is this machine going to make the business? How much revenue will I earn? And when we looked at the demand for labor last week, we remember that that's how the firm made the comparison when they're trying to determine the demand for labor. They think about how much money is this worker going to bring. So they're going to look at the same concept for capital. How much money is this machine going to make for my business versus how much money am I going to actually have to spend to acquire the machine? Right. The only challenge when you're making the comparison with the marginal revenue product of capital and the cost of capital is that it's a little different from labor in the sense that it's easier for you to make an estimation about what labor is worth in terms of how much would that labor unit produce. When we're looking at capital, it's a little more challenging just because capital is considered to be a durable good, so it will last you for years and years. So the demand for capital goes on producing and it yields revenue for the firm in the future for a long period, which is why I mentioned before that it's durable. Now, calculating these benefits, that's the future benefits, it involves taking into account the timing. How long will you have these capital goods for? So, as I mentioned before, we have to look at the present value of something, of some amount of money that you know that this um, unit of capital will earn you in the future. So one approach in making the assessment on the demand for capital is looking at the present value approach. Now the firm compares the marginal benefits with the marginal cost of the investment. Present value approach looks at working out the benefit of the investment, that's its MRP, and the firm must estimate all future earnings. So the firm in considering to buy a machine is going to think about Okay, how long is this machine going to be useful in my business and how much money will it make me over the period of years that I will have the machine? Also, it will compare this to the cost of the investment. Now, say for instance, and this is where I want us to, you know, jot down some information quickly. And I did say that you would need a book or paper and pen and pencil. So you decide to start a business to produce protective masks. Now, in order for you to produce those masks, you will need to purchase an industrial sewing machine so that you can sew them together. You don't have a sewing machine. Now, it will produce masks valued at 1,000 US dollars. So, you're gonna have to purchase 
the machine. And what you know is that based on what the machine will produce, you will earn 1,000 US dollars per year. That's the value of the mass that it will produce for four years. And then the machine will eventually wear out and you will be able to sell what's left of it for 1,000 US dollars. So that's 1,000 US dollars for four years, right? So 1,000 in each year. And then the machine will have a scrap value of $1,000. Now, what is the benefit of this machine to your firm? Is it the $1,000 each year for four years plus the additional $1,000 in scrap value, which would be a total of $5,000? We're gonna look back at this later. All right, so keep in mind that the money earned in the future is less beneficial to you than having the same amount of money today. So if somebody promises to give you a million dollars in 20 years time, the million, that same amount of money might not be as beneficial in 20 years as it would be to have it right now. So you can earn interest on that money. If you are given it today, you can earn interest by putting it in the bank. So it might be beneficial for you to have the money now. And besides, we all prefer to have money right now than to have money in the future. So say you have $200 today and you can earn 10% interest by putting it in the bank. After a year, that $200, 10% of 200 would be 20. $20. So the $200 plus the $20 would have grown to $220 after a year. Following that same principle, if it is that you calculate 10% of this $220, it means in two years time, that initial investment of $200 or that initial amount of money you put down in the bank will grow to $242. And in three years time, it will grow to $266.20. And I hope you're doing your calculations just to make sure that all of this is correct, right? So that's just the, the basic idea here. Now this process where we're adding the interest is known as compounding. So it means then that if someone offers to give you $242 is in two years time, it would be the same as if the person is offering you $200 today. And if someone says to you, hey, would you like to have $200 today or $220 in one year? It would be the same based on the interest that's offered. Now, compounding is a process, as I mentioned, of, of adding interest each year to an initial capital sum. So this is compounding adding interest each year to the initial capital sum. Present value. All right, so we're continue, continuing. So if 10% interest rate is $242 for an, initial, for an initial deposit of $200 in two years time, right? So at 10% interest, $200 in two years become $242. Now, the procedure of reducing that future value back to its present value is known as discounting. So let me just go back quickly. So when we're doing compounding, we're adding interest each year to an initial capital sum. But discounting is reducing the future value back to a present value. Now, when discounting, the rate used is the rate of discount. And in this case, it's the interest rate that is also the discount rate. Now, this is a formula for calculating the discount rate. And I'll show you a slightly different formula a little bit later. So in this formula, it's PV equal FV divided by one plus I raised to the power of N and PV is present value, FV is future value, I refers to the interest or the discount rate and N is the number of periods or in most instances, the period is a year. So you just started high school and your parents promised to give you, remember I asked you this question earlier, $10,000 when you're graduating in five years. Is $10,000 in five years as valuable as $10,000 today? What is the present value of $10,000 promise? to you in five years if the discount rate is 6%, meaning if you have the money right now, you can put it in a bank and earn a 6% interest rate. Now to calculate, we have the formula here again, just to remind you. So we're gonna plug those numbers into the formula. So the future value is $10,000 and the interest rate is 6%. So we're gonna put the interest rate in decimal place. So 
this would be equal to $10,000 plus divided by 1 plus 0 0.6. So that's 10,000 divided by 1.06 raised to the power of 5. And that will be equal to 1.338. So that's $10,000 divided by 1.338. And so the present value of that $10,000 is $7,473.84. 7, so if your parents offered you $7,473.84, $7,473.84, it would be the same as giving you $10,000 in five years, right? Now, some, in some instances, you may be given a question with a cash flow. And if you're given the cash flow, meaning different a sum of money over different years, then you'll just find the present value of each cash flow and then sum all of that. So this is why the, this formula is a little different. All right, so what is the present value of the investment in the machine that produces $1,000 for four years and then is sold as scrap for $1,000 at the end of the four years? Remember that question about producing masks and also purchasing a sewing machine. So the discount rate or the interest rate is 10%. So using this formula, since we have a cash flow, we'll notice that in year one, it's 1,000 divided by 1.1, and we have this 1.1 because it's one plus the discount rate of 10%, which when we convert it to decimal, it's 0.1. And for year two, following the similar format that we did earlier, we raised the discount factor to the power of two. Year three, we raise it to three, and year four to four. Now for year four, we have $2,000 because the machine earns $1,000 in year four, and it also has a scrap value of $1,000. So that's how we got the $2,000 for year four. So the present value, when all of this calculation is done, will be equal to $3,852. How do you know if the investment is worthwhile? Now, the present value of the investment is its marginal revenue product. Now, this means that if the firm has the $3,852 today and deposited it, it in the bank at an interest rate of 10%, the firm would earn exactly the same amount as it would if it invests in the machine right now. So, to determine if the firm should um, go ahead with this investment. The firm is going to compare the cost of the machine with its marginal revenue product of $3,852. So it will be worth buying if it is a case where the firm is going to pay less than or the same amount. So if the firm has to pay more than this, then it will be better for the firm to keep its money. So the difference between the present value benefits or the marginal revenue product and the cost is known as the net present value. Now, if the net present value is positive, if you get a positive figure, it simply means that the cash inflow is greater than the present value of the cash outflow. So the money, the pre when you're looking at today, the present day, the amount of money that you'd get from the machine when it makes, when it contributes to production in your firm will be greater than what you'll actually spend on the machine. So if it is positive, then it's a worthy investment and the firm should go ahead. Now, if the present value, if the net present value is zero, it simply means that the firm is breaking even. So the same amount, that, same amount of money that they would pay to acquire the machine is the same amount of money that the machine will earn in terms of marginal revenue products. Now, if the net present value is however negative, it simply means that it's going to cost the firm more to acquire the machine. So this means that the present value of cash inflow is less than the present value of cash outflow. So they're going to have to spend a greater amount of money to purchase the machine than it will be worth to them. So if the, present, if the net present value is negative, then the firm should not go ahead with this investment. Now, what is the present value of a machine that lasts for three years, earns $500, and then has a scrap value of $100? Assume that the rate of discount is 5%. If the machine costs $500, is the investment worthwhile? And also, would it be worthwhile if the investment 
if the discount rate is 10%. Now I want you to calculate the discount rate at 10% and we'll look at that when we're doing our recap. But I'm gonna go through the first part of the example which looks at what happens when the discount rate is 5%. So the machine lasts for three years, earned $500 $5 and then has a scrap value of 100. Using the same formula, we'll realize that the present value, if the discount rate is 5%, the present value will be $518. Now, if this machine costs $500, then it's going to be a worthwhile investment because the present value is $518 and the net present value would be $18, which is a positive figure. So please remember to do the calculation if the discount rate is 10% and we'll look at that while we're doing our recap. Now, I mentioned before that firms or individuals when they're considering to make investment decisions, in most instances or in some instances, they need to borrow money from somewhere and they might go to a financial institution to acquire the financial capital so that they can acquire capital in the form of machinery or building. So we want to look at what motivates or what influences individuals and firms when they're making a decision about whether or not to borrow money to invest. Now, in looking at that, we have to look at the rate of interest and the interest rate is basically the price of borrowing. Now, the rate of interest is determined similarly to how the price of regular goods and services are determined and this is by the interaction of the supply and demand in the market for loanable funds. So supply re represents accumulated savings because as I mentioned before, in order for financial institutions to have money, people need to make deposits and people make deposits when they are saving. Now, in this example of the supply and demand curve, this is a market for loanable funds and where we have price that's really the rate of interest. So the typical demand curve slopes downwards and it's the same for the market for loanable funds and households will borrow more money at lower rates of interest, which if you're comparing this to the market for goods and services, when the price of goods and service are, services are lower, that's when you purchase more goods and services. So the concept is similar. When interest rates are lower, people will borrow more money because the price of money is cheaper, right? So it, it becomes cheaper for you to borrow money to make an investment at lower interest rates. Now the demand curve also reflects the falling rate of return on investments. And this is due to the law of diminishing returns. Now, as interest rates lower, it becomes more profitable to invest in projects that have a lower rate of return and the quantity of, lower, of loanable funds demanded therefore rises. So when interest rates are lower, more people will want to borrow money. So if there is a rise in the demand for capital, maybe there's an improvement in technology and this is what causes the rise in demand for capital. Then this will cause an increase in the demand for loanable funds, which will cause the demand curve to shift because the improvement in technology is a non-price factor. So the demand curve will shift outward to the right as displayed here and what will happen is that the equilibrium rate of interest will rise and encourage more people to save. So at higher interest rates, more people save and less people are borrowing money. The next concept we want to look at today is transfer earnings and economic rent. Now, when we speak about um, factors of production, we know that factors of production do generate income for the owners of those factors. Now, transfer earnings are what a factor must earn to prevent from moving to alternative use. As it relates to labor, this is what people must be paid in order to persuade them to stay in their job. So think about it. So maybe if you are considering to apply for a job in the summer, if it's possible, and whether going to a workplace physically or online, you're gonna make a, a very good consideration and you're gonna think, is it worth it for me to go to a job that's gonna pay me, for example, $3,000 per week? In your mind, you're gonna have a minimum amount that you will require in order for you to provide your services. Now, 
the transfer earnings, as I mentioned, is the minimum that people need to earn in order to persuade them to stay in their present job. So if you're in a job and they're paying you the minimum you're willing to accept and they decide that they're going to cut salary, you might decide to leave because it's below your transfer earnings. Now, say for instance, your minimum to stay in a job is $20,000 per week and they're paying you $25,000 per week. Whatever that is in excess of your transfer earnings is referred to as economic rent. So economic rent is anything over and above your transfer earnings. So for example, so take the case of Nurse Dana at the public hospital. She earns a million dollars per year. She could earn $800,000 annually if she went to a private hospital and would transfer to another job if her salary was cut below $800,000. So if at her current job they decide to cut her salary below $800,000, she would leave because that amount is her transfer earnings. Right? So the remaining $200,000 would be her economic rent because that's above the minimum she requires to stay in the job. Now, looking at the market supply for nurses, if we start at point B on this graph and we move to point C, as the wage rate is increased, more nurses are attracted. So we notice that the supply of labor curve slopes upwards. So at higher wage rates, more people will enter the the market they'll make themselves available to become nurses because they have a different amount of transfer earnings than the persons that were already in the market now at a, each higher wage rate the new nurses are getting just enough to persuade them to transfer into the profession so after the wage rate increases more people join the profession because of the increase so it says the wage rate for them is entirely transfer earnings, but nurses already in the profession will get economic rent. Now, they are getting more than the minimum necessary to keep them in the profession. Now, economic, work, economic rent for a worker is the different be difference between the actual wage rate and the point on the supply curve which they entered the market. So, how much is the wage rate? And at what point did they enter the market? What wage rate on the supply curve? So if we go back to this graph, if it is that the wage rate is at A and the worker entered the market somewhere between B and A before the wage rate got that high, that difference would be their economic rent. So before we go to recap i just want to remind you that there is a question that you were given and this question reminds you to use the formula for calculating the present value of a machine so i wanted to take the time make sure you have this question written down work it out before we go to the break so when we come back you're ready for the recap And I'm going to go back to the formula shortly. All right, so let's look back at the formula quickly so that you can do this calculation while we're on a break. So just a reminder, so present value is equal to future value divided by one plus the interest rate or the discount rate. And you have to convert the interest rate to decimal. You, will, you are given a percentage, you need to convert it to decimal and then raise it to the power of N and N refers to the number of periods or a year. So if the question mentioned 10 years, you raise it to 10 or if it's five and so on. Also be reminded that if the net present value is positive, it means that cash inflows is greater than the investment and then the investment is worthwhile. And if the net present value is zero, it also means that the investment is access acceptable because the business would not be spending more than they would earn from that factor of production capital. If however you do your calculation and the net present value is negative, 
right? And negative is not a good term, so that's just a little hint for you to remember. If the net present value is negative, it means that the inflow is less than the present value and the investment should be rejected. If you have any questions on what we've done so far, please remember you can send them in on our various platforms and I will see if I can answer them in the final segment. Now, when we come back, we answer your questions and wrap up. We'll be right back, so don't go anywhere. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with TVJ, present Schools Not Out. CSEC and CAPE Lessons live Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon with weekly Schools Not Out tutorial sessions on Saturdays from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Schools Not Out, live CSEC and CAPE Lessons here on TVJ. The COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick, before, during, and after you prepare food, before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, and after handling animals or animal waste. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with TVJ, present Schools Not Out. CSEC and CAPE Lessons live Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon with weekly Schools Not Out tutorial sessions on Saturdays from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Schools Not Out, live CSEC and CAPE Lessons here on TVJ. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick, before, during, and after you prepare food, before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, and after handling animals or animal waste. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with the cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with... Hi, and welcome back to Schools Not All, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. Today, we're we have been discussing CAPE Economics Unit 1, the demand for and supply of factors. We are also focusing on the demand for capital. So if you're just joining us, you missed something very interesting, but hopefully you can benefit from this recap. Now, before we went on a break, I gave you a question. So the question is to determine the present value of a machine that lasts for three years, earns $500 and then has a scrap value of $100. The machine costs $500 for the firm. And what we want to determine for this firm is if the investment is worthwhile. Now, would it be worthwhile if the investment or if the discount rate for this investment is 10%? 
we did this similar question, but we looked at a case where the discount rate was 5%. And what we found was that when the discount rate was 5%, the investment was worthwhile because the present value of the investment was equal to $518. So if the firm was making the comparison, it would be looking at how much money that it would spend on acquiring the machine now, which would be $500, and also what the machine would earn, which is the marginal revenue product. So the task was yours to determine whether or not the discount rate of 10% 10 10 would have presented the firm with a situation where the investment would have still be worthwhile. Now, since you took the time to do your calculation, I also took the time to do it as well. So based on this question, you would have found that the total earnings was $600. And this you would determine from the $500 that the machine would earn over the three year period, plus the $100 that it would earn as in scrap value. So the future value would be $600. Now, in order to find the present value, we use about the same formula that we have been using throughout the lesson. So it's $600 divided by one plus 0.1. And that 0.1 is 10% converted to decimal. Now, present value is equal to one plus 0.1. Sorry, it's equal to 600 divided by one plus 0.1. And that's raised to the power of three. So one plus 0.1 is 1.1 raised to the power of three. And if you did that calculation, 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1 or use the appropriate function on your calculator you would have gotten 1.331 so the present value is equal to 600 dollars divided by 1.331 so the present value would have been equal to 450 dollars and if you remember the statement or the question said that the machine costs four cost $500 and you have determined that the present value of the $600 in terms of future earnings is actually $450. So is, in, is the investment worthwhile if the machine costs $500 and the present value is $450? In order for us to make this determination, we need to calculate the net present value. And as you remember, the net present value is equal to present value benefit minus cost or the marginal revenue product minus cost. And in this case, the present value benefit is $450, but the actual cost of acquiring the capital unit is $500. So $450, and if you have that figure and you subtract 500, you'll notice that you'll get a negative figure. And before we went to the break, you know, we said we're not into the negativity and negativity is not good. So we know that a negative figure is not good for the firm when we're calculating net present value. The negative figure essentially means that the investment is not worthwhile because the firm would lose money. And the firm would lose money because even though this $600 in the future looks like a larger number than the $500 that you'd spend today for the machine, Considering that the firm has the option of putting this $500 in the bank to earn six to earn 10% in interest, it simply means that if the present value of this $600 is actually $450, and I'm going to have to spend, or you're going to have to spend, or the firm is going to have to spend $500 to today to acquire something that is actually worth $450 in terms of revenue, then this investment is not worthwhile. So we also looked at the demand for capital, which that was a part of it. So we looked at the demand for capital to determine how the firm you know, makes a decision. And the firm has to look at the fact that the capital is a durable component of production. So they have to make an estimation of the future earnings of capital and then convert that future earnings into a present value amount. Then 
we use the present value formula to make that determination and calculate the net present value. So that's how the firm makes the determination. And just a reminder that it's all connected. So last week we looked at the fact that the firm compares the marginal revenue product for labor and they do the same thing for land and they make the comparison with what they'll spend to acquire labor or land. The principle is the same for capital. It's just that we have a different formula for calculating it. <clears throat> also, how do you determine if an investment is worthwhile? Do you remember I just said it a few seconds ago? So again, if the present value, if the net present value is zero or positive, then the investment is worthwhile. And we looked at the determination of interest rates and we said that interest rates are determined similar to how the price of goods and services are determined in the regular market. It's simply by the interaction of the supply and demand in the market for loanable funds. So looking at financial institutions and their supply of loanable funds, which comes from the number of savings or number of deposits that they have. So there's a comparison or there is a relationship between the amount of money that is supplied and also what is being demanded. So when there's a high demand for loanable funds, that will drive the interest rates up. And when interest rates are higher, then persons will be pers persuaded to save rather than to spend on investment. However, when interest rates are lower, people are discouraged from saving. It might be better for them to spend the money now than for them to put it in the bank to earn a small interest rate. So when interest rates are low, this encourages demand. So more people demand loanable funds and less people are willing to save. We also looked at the concept of transfer earnings and economic rent. And we mentioned that transfer earnings looks at the minimum amount of factor requires for it to stay in its present use or in the case of labor, transfer earnings looks at the minimum that someone requires in order for them to stay in their current job. And if they're earning the minimum and say hypothetically say $10,000 is your minimum per week to stay in a particular job. And if it is that day you are offered something less than that, then you'll decide to walk away from the job. It's not worthwhile to you. If you get anything above your minimum, or in this case, above the $10,000, whatever you have earned in excess is referred to as your economic rent. So transfer earnings is the minimum you need to stay in place, and the economic rent is anything that you get in excess of that minimum. So some resources that you can use while preparing for your exam that I've used to prepare this lesson are the economics, the CAPE Economics Study Guide for self-study and distance learning and this is for unit one and also economic seventh edition by john sloman please remember to use the cxc website go to cxc stores and download your syllabus in your syllabus you will find specimen questions you'll find paper two questions and paper one questions multiple choice questions and short answer questions and you'll also find the answer to those questions please take the opportunity also to read the report so you can see some of CXC's report based, reports based on challenges that candidates have had on some questions. This will give you an insight to help you prepare for your examination. So next week, we will look at wage differentials. So please come prepared with your question for your questions for that lesson, because we know that you'll have plenty of questions for wage differentials. That's all today for Cape Economics Unit 1 the demand for and supply of factors. We hope you grasp some of the points we discussed. I hope you grasp all of them, right? So you can watch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN today at 4 p.m. in the Schools Not Out highlights on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. right here on TVJ. It also will be available on video on demand on One Spot Media. So until next time, I'm Shani Francis. Please don't go anywhere. CSEC accounts is next.